president of CSA and a true fan of our keynote speaker, Sister Diane. Um, on behalf of the Social Justice Committee and CSA, we welcome you to a very special evening. Care for the Earth, home to all living creatures. Tonight we have a rich program planned for you. Sister Diane Bergen, CSA, will be our keynote speaker and talk about Pope Francis and his encyclical on the environment. We also have door prizes. If you fill out a name card, you may be a lucky winner at a copy of this particular special uh, publication. After Sister Diane's keynote presentation, we have a panel of experts who will complement her presentation on, comment, on comments on climate change. Dr. John Morris from Marion University, the science perspective. Dr. Kevin Quinn from St. Norbert College from an economical perspective. Mr. Steve Borowski from the Rural Clinic from a business perspective. And lastly, Sister Jean Steffes from CSA from on moral choices. So we have again a rich evening planned for you. As I mentioned before, the uh, event is co-sponsored by the Congregation of Sisters of St. Agnes and Mary University's Social Justice Committee. And we do have refreshments. I did uh, do a quality check on the cookies, and they're very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when I, uh, I'm part of the uh, Social Justice Committee, and they asked for volunteers to introduce our keynote speaker. And I was so honored to introduce this dynamic and fantastic woman who I had known for almost 20 some years um, here through Merritt University and CSA. Sister Diane Bergan, CSA, is a former Carol Sturmweiler, CPA, CP Distinguished Professor of the Old Testament Studies at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. She holds a BS in elementary education from Marion College, now uh, Marion University. She has an MA and a PhD in Biblical Languages and Literature from St. Louis University. Sister Diane was president of the Catholic Biblical Association of America and has also been active member of the Chicago Catholic Jewish Scholars Dialogue for the past 20 years. For more than 15 years, she was the Old Testament book reviewer of the Bible today. Sister Diane was a member of the editorial board of that magazine for 25 years. Five of those years, she served as the magazine's general editor. From 2002 to 2005, Sister Diane wrote the weekly column, The Word, for the America Magazine. She is currently working in the areas of biblical interpretation and theology, particularly the issues of peace, ecology, and feminism. Now, she only has about 20 minutes to half an hour to speak, and if I had to read through all her publications, I ate up half of her time. So, it is my honor and our privilege to welcome Sister Diane back to Marion College, Marion University. Sister? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start out by quoting, or at least referring to uh, a, a, an article that appeared in 1967 in Science Magazine, written by an historian by the name of Lynn White. It's a man, Lynn White. And if you do any kind of study on the question of ecology, you will come across this particular name. Because this, this article talks about the historical roots of our ecological crisis. And he really puts the blame of the pollution of the natural world at the doorstep of the Judeo-Christian tradition, which of course is rooted in the Bible, uh, particularly in one of the creation narratives, Genesis 1, where the commission given was subdue and have dominion. And while I'm not going to do a biblical exegesis of this particular passage, I think it's important simply to note why he claims that it is really the Judeo-Christian tradition that is, that is primarily responsible for an awful lot of our mentality that has resulted in exploitation of and devastation of the natural world. For example, he talks about when the Judeo-Christian tradition, and of course at this point it would be the Jewish tradition, the tradition of ancient Israel, we think monotheism is a wonderful move, and I'm not saying it wasn't, 
But, but when monotheism takes over in any kind of a culture, one of the things that it does is silence and undermine animism. Animism, which is a religious thinking that elements within nature, elements over which we have no control, are really formed by and, and, and dynamic and functioning through the power of some divine beings. So in a certain sense, what the Judeo-Christian tradition has done is to desacralize the natural world. Now, again, I am not in any way, you know, advertising or trying to promote, you know, this, the, 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 um, the debate is on a different program tonight. So I'm not in any way, you know, trying to proselytize that we should go back to animism. But I think it's important for us to understand what the challenge is and what the, what the attack is. You cannot deny that we, if you read the Bible, the, the, the ancient uh, Israelites, our religious ancestors, did not believe that the sun and the moon and the stars were somehow divine, where more traditional people did. That also means they had a tremendous respect for elements within the natural world. So that's one of the ways that he says, you know, we are responsible because in a certain sense, particularly in the West, in Western civilization, with the Enlightenment, the wonder, and we're all children of the Enlightenment. And one of the things that the Enlightenment did was enable us to do scientific examination, which means we step back from science, we step back from the natural world, and we analyze it. But then we analyze it as something outside of ourselves. And it didn't teach us how to go back and acknowledge it's not something outside of ourselves. Now again, I'm not saying I agree with this, but there are some very interesting challenges here. And I just uh, explain it in that way because I want to read one paragraph in this particular document and then uh, show the relationship with, between what I'm reading and the, uh, the Holy Father's encyclical. Toward the end of the document, Lynn White says this, what we do about ecology depends on our ideas of the man-nature relationship. This is 1967. He did not know in 1967 that man is not an inclusive term. <laughs> All right? So today he would have said humankind. He would not have said man. But at any rate, it depends on our ideas of this relationship. More science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecologic crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. Now, I agree with that statement. And so does Francis. Because what we have in this document is a new way of looking at ourselves and our relationship with the natural world. And I want to say, friends, this is a radical shift that we have to face in our day and age. Let me read another paragraph, please. Throughout the history of human enlightenment, significant revolutionary scientific discoveries have forced new cosmological renderings and theological revisions have followed this reshaping. An example. If you read the Bible, in traditional societies, they believe that we lived in at least a three-tiered universe. That we live on a flat earth, the gods are in the heavens, and the dead are under the earth. Because that's where we put them. Now, in that kind of a cosmology, ascension into heaven makes sense. Assumption into heaven makes sense. But we know we don't live on a flat earth. We live on a sphere. Living on a sphere, which way is up? 
and how far is up. And I say this facetiously, and I intend in a certain sense to underscore the impossibility of understanding this literally. Scientists would tell us if Jesus really physically ascended into heaven, unless he has hit something out in the universe, the further he goes from Earth, the faster he is moving, and he's still on a trajectory shooting out into the universe. Now you can appreciate in a certain sense that's ridiculous. But if we understand it literally, we see it's ridiculous. Now I am not saying I don't I don't believe in the resurrection of the body, life everlasting, or I don't believe, you know, that Jesus ascended into heaven. But I don't think we are to understand it in a very literal sense, which calls for a new way of understanding. So, I go back to this paragraph. Significant revolutionary scientific discoveries have forced new cosmological renderings and theological revisions have followed this reshaping. Example, Pythagoras insisted that the Earth is a sphere and not flat, challenged literal belief that God is enthroned in the heavens above us. It challenged that. But that does not mean that we no longer think that, there, that God is in heaven. But we may not think of it as being like a planet, a supernatural planet. Copernicus and the heliocentric mo model of the universe further threatened well-established concepts of divinely determined human dominance in the universe. We don't any longer believe that the sun revolves around the earth. We believe that we revolve around the sun. Today science tells us we shouldn't even talk about universe. We should talk about multiverse. That there are millions, probably millions of universes. Now think of this. Let's say there are millions of universes. But only one of them is really significant. <laughs> and in our universe, there are millions of galaxies. But only the Milky Way is an important one. And in the Milky Way, there might be who knows how many possible solar systems. But only one of them is worthwhile. And that's ours. And in the solar system, just the Earth. And on Earth, just us. I think that's a little arrogant. <laughs> but notice, the more we understand about science, the more we have to redefine what does it mean to be a human being in this universe. So again, new scientific insights force us to understand anthropology, what it means to be a human being, and consequently too, understand our theology differently. Another one, Darwin's insight into evolutionary processes dis disputes the notion of direct creation of humankind. Now Darwin, of course, did not say we evolved from the monkeys. And if he did, some haven't yet made the leap. <laughs> <laughs> what he's talking about is you and me, this is what happens after several million years. Look what Earth can bring forth. That's what he's talking about. So astounding scientific facts have continued to be uncovered and corresponding theological reinterpretations repeatedly required. Now these were momentous times in the history of humankind. And you and I are in one now. With all new cosmology, it is forcing us to understand what does it mean, you know, to the image of God? What does all of this mean? What does it mean, to, you know, to be part of an emerging universe? And it always, it always threatens, I don't think so much our faith, but it certainly threatens the way we have understood our faith. So again, I am saying what Lynn White said in 67. 
And that is, new insights into ecology is not enough. We've got to change our understanding of theology. Now that should not frighten us, because we've gone through the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> and we've had to reinterpret our theology. Now, I don't think, however, that what lays ahead of us in terms of relooking at our faith and our concepts of faith, our understanding of our relationship with the natural world said better the rest of the natural world and our relationship with God, in no way can you compare that with the Second Vatican Council. Second Vatican Council simply scratches the furnace. Just a scratch. Now, what does Laudato Si have to say about this? It's a very long article or a very long document. There are six chapters. I personally, as a theologian, am interested primarily in two of them. Chapter two, he, the, the Pope talks about what he calls radical ecology. And in chapter six, the last chapter, he talks about what implications in our lives would come from this radical ecology. And of course, when he talks about radical ecology, I mean, ecology simply <coughs> means, you know, uh, it, it comes from the, the, the Greek two words, uh, uh, eikos, which means household. And the other one is law of the household. Ecology simply means, you know, what's, uh, how, do, how do things fit together in a system? And you and I are part of the same system. But the system is not simply humankind. You and I are what Earth produces, not just mother and dad. We are what Earth produces. Scientists, not simply poets, say we are natural creation reflecting on itself. Give it enough time, and as I say, what do they say, 3.8 or something million years uh, in order for, uh, for this to, to uh, uh, develop. So it takes a long time, but look what it has produced. So the, the Pope is talking about this. He, in, in chapter two, he is talking about how in, it, important it is, it is essential that we stop thinking of ourselves as separate from the rest of the natural world. As if we are not part of it. We come from it, we feed off of it, we eat it, we breathe it, we drink it, and we go back to it. We are it. In a certain sense, I think it is strange to talk about a relationship with the natural world. That suggests we're separate from it. Do you talk about having a relationship with your hand? <laughs> it's part of us. Now you can talk about your hand, or your nose, or your ear, or any other part, but it's you, or it's me. So in a certain sense, relationship, sometimes the way we use the language, suggests we're separate. The Holy Father is saying, we have to stop thinking we're separate from it. And he uses some very important words that theological ecologists use. One of them is interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. Why is it that we can eat food and turn it into ourselves? There is some kind of connection there. Or drink, there is a connection there. We don't simply live off of each other's parts, though we can. We can live off of people's kidneys. We can live off of somebody else's heart. We can live off of somebody else's lungs. We can live off of somebody else's blood. So there's a very natural connection within the species, but also there's a connection with other species as well, with other kinds of species as well. And that's very important for us to realize. We're part of it, and it is part of us. I am not a deep, deep ecologist. Deep ecologists would say, the worst thing 
that has happened to the natural world is the appearance of the human species. No other species destroys its environment the way we do. No other species. And I am not pushing for birth control or population control, but those other species, there's, there's something that we don't like, and I don't like it, you know, there's some, something called predation. There are predators. There is violence in the natural world, and not just among us, but there is violence in the natural world. But somehow or other, it keeps a balance. Again, I have heard it said, maybe if we really want to clean up the air, and we really want to clean up the water, and we really want to clean up the soil. Now, I'm not a scientist. You're going to hear scientists talk about this in Nordic, just, you know. I'm not a scientist, so I, I speak, you know, as, you know, from the vernacular, you know. <laughs> what we have to do is wait a long time and live it alone, and it can clean itself up. But you and I will not see that, because we're not going to last that long. We are just a blip, you know, on this magnificent adventure that we call the universe. So, interconnectedness, very important. And the, other, uh, uh, and the other one is interdependence. We are dependent on the natural world. Now, in a certain sense, it is not dependent on us. It is not dependent on us. Cosmologists tell us that the world of which we are a part, which means this, work, this room where we are, the world of which we are a part is at least 10 dimensions. 10 dimensions. We are wired for four of them. Length, width, depth, and time. <coughs> How can we think we are the apex of creation when we're not even wired for 50% of it? And yet we do. I remember as a kid learning in both science and in the, in the uh, religion class the pyramid. And on the bottom of the pyramid is inanimate creatures. Rocks, hills, you know, inanimate creatures. And one step above is vegetation. And one step above that is sentient living, animals. And one step above that is, is human beings. And then there's also a hierarchy. You know, the, the lowest was children, then women, then men, and then maybe, but it's not a natural creation, angels. It depends upon what your religion was. But for sure, you had that kind of hierarchy. I am not denying the different complexity of psychic development. I mean, beavers can make dams, but they don't write poetry, right? And no, that is not to say that they don't have any kind of psychic development. Animals we know have memory. Otherwise, Lassie would never have come home. <laughs> so there is some kind of, you know, essential development. So as I say this, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is significant difference. But what is the difference? What is the difference? I think an analogy, the human body, is a wonderful analogy of the body of the natural world. In a very real sense, you can't live without a brain. So, so there are some parts of the natural world, you know, that are essential for it to function in a certain way. But if that's all you are is the brain, the brain also needs hands and feet. And you and I know, you get a little beauty mark, is what they call sometimes, a little tiny mark on your body, any place on your body, and it can kill you. It can be cancerous, and it can kill you. So, we're, again, we're part of all of this, but what part? And, and what, what Francis is trying to say in that chapter, that we are part of it, but we are not so superior that we can dismiss it. Now, I've already talked about two ideas, interconnectedness and interdependence. Something else. Value. There's two kinds of value that cosmologists talk about. 
One is intrinsic value. That means something has value in itself. And the other one is instrumental value. And that means it has value in its ability to do something. Now, why does anything have value? And I want to say, we think, because we are so anthropocentric, which means anthropos comes, of course, from the Greek word for human being, and centered, human-centered. If it does not serve our purposes, it has no value. That's very, very anthropocentric. People would say, it has value simply because it's here. A little biblical material. The book of Job. Uh, in the book of Job, most people don't know the book. Most people who say they know the book of Job don't know the book of Job. They know the story of Job is a righteous man suffers. He clings to his righteousness. And in the end, God rewards him. The book of Job is 42 chapters. What I have just described is the first two chapters and the last 10 verses of chapter 42. The real book of Job begins with chapter 3, where Job is angry with God and says, you are the one who has done this to me. I have done nothing to deserve this kind of suffering. And when his visitors, some call him his friends, I think, who needs friends like that? <laughs> they come in and say, you must have done something wrong. He keeps saying, I didn't, did not deserve this. God has been unfair. I think a good picture of Job is not the meek Job, but a Job who shakes his fist to heaven. Because he keeps saying, this is unfair. And the reader knows it is. We're the only ones who know Job is right. Because it says so in the, in the part, first part of the book. So he says, this is unfair. I am suffering unfairly. And then God appears, says not one word about justice. Not one word. Says not one word about human suffering. Read it, chapter 38. A whole set of questions. Where were you when I created the universe? Do you know how it works? Do you hold back the waters? And always asking questions, like a good teacher asks good questions so that the student can answer. And so God asks all these questions. And if, the, if there were answers, Job would have to say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I cannot control it. All about the universe. And a second set of questions, all about animals. But animals which, at this time in Israel's history, human beings had no control over which means useless animals that God can, takes control of. So the book of Job shows us <clears throat> that natural world, elements in the natural world, has value in itself. I am not crazy about mosquitoes. <laughs> All right? Um, and, you know, but the, the, obviously it has a purpose. They have purpose. I don't know what they are. You know, but they have a purpose. Otherwise, they wouldn't be part of our ecosystem. I just as soon stay away from them. Actually, I just as soon they stay away from me. But again, we, we judge everything in terms of how does it affect us. Another example. What's good weather? <laughs> you ever thought about that? Good weather is weather that does not inconvenience us. Several years ago, I spent some time in Africa. South Africa in December. I went to South Africa. And you don't go. You don't leave Chicago in July and go to South Africa. You leave Chicago in December and go to South Africa. And I came home, and in uh, it was a 56 degrees below zero wind chill factor. And one of the first things in the news I became very aware of: a man was furious because his car wouldn't start. Six, 56 degrees below zero, a car has a right not to start. <laughs> so what does the man do? He went into the house, he got his revolver, and he shot the radiator twice. <laughs> it was in the news. Now what does it something, I mean, we can laugh about it, but that is, that is indicative sometimes of how we judge weather. 
Have you never been upset when it's snowing and the bus is late? <laughs> I mean, really, bad weather is weather that inconveniences us. And, uh, again, you know, and we can talk about weather and climate change and everything, and it inconveniences us. Sometimes serious inconvenience. Look what's going on down in South Carolina. I was in India, in, up in the north, when the tsunami hit in the south, and the question was always, why did all those people die? And the answer is, because they were there. But that's not the question that people were asking. They were asking, why did God allow that? They wanted God, God to hold back the laws of nature and step in and work against the laws of nature. Now, I am not saying they deserve to die. I'm just saying we judge things in the natural world in terms of how it affects us. All right? Look into yourself. We've got to begin to change some of those ideas. We are not, you know, king or queen of the mountain. And that's what Francis is talking about. We have to realize that there is an interdependence. There is an interconnectedness. And he's asking for a new frame of reference, a new way of looking, which we today, as always, call humility, which is, in many ways, un-American. <laughs> Traditional people had a very different attitude toward the natural world. And many times it is because they couldn't control the forces. As soon as we learn to control the forces, and I'm all for, I mean, I, I almost sound like I'm anti-technology, and I'm not. I mean, I drove up here. I didn't walk from Chicago. There, it's almost as if there is the mentality, give us enough money and we'll crack, you know, the secrets of the universe. I, I'm really personally uncomfortable with those kind of attitudes. I don't know. You know, Stephen Hawking, not, you know, um, Maybe think, well, Stephen Hawking thinks that you know, if we garbage up this planet, then we should move to another one. And so now we got Matt Damon on another planet. <laughs> okay? But we're not Martian. We're Earthlings. We're Earth. We are of Earth. Are we really going to? Uh... That's another workshop. That's another workshop. Uh, now, Francis may not be developing these ideas in the same way as I have, but that's what he's talking about. We must readjust our way of thinking. Or, if we don't, the way, you know, civilization deals with new scientific insights will not include any religious values that we might have. That's what he's calling for a new way of understanding who we are as citizens of Earth, as children of Earth. Who we are, what is our relationship? What do we think is valuable and why do we think it is valuable? And again, think of Job. The very fact that those animals had been created were considered valuable, whether they're useful or not. Just think about usefulness. Just think about what you, and as I must think about what I, value things that they're useful. And if they're not, we discard them. And sometimes we do that with people. How do we value ourselves and other people? Frequently by their productivity. Not by the fact that they have been born. But they are productive. How many people who are suffering any kind of diminishment Physical, mental, age diminishment feel useless. Where did they get that idea? It's part of our thinking. It's part of our ethos. No one is useless. Everyone is valuable intrinsically. If they don't produce, they don't produce. But that does not give them or diminish their value. These are some of the things that force us to look anew at what it means to be citizens of this magnificent venture that we call Earth and life. We are part of it. And it was good enough for God, then it should be good enough for us as well. Well, one could go on and on. But those are just a couple of things to think about. That's what you find 
in chapter 2. And then in the last chapter, he gives some suggestions. If we begin to think like this, then maybe this is the way we should begin to act. And in no way am I suggesting it's easy. It's extremely complicated. It's extremely complicated. But complexity does not give us the right to step back and let somebody else do it. You and I have been given this magnificent privilege. But with that privilege also comes the responsibility of recognizing it is all gift. We deserved none of it. None of it. And how do we use and appreciate the gift that is ours from a God who's really quite creative. Thank you.